I'm all the way from Green Lake, so not too far. Uh, here, let me get my machine going. I fortunately didn't bring my clicker, but I'll just stand over here anyway. So I'm going to be talking on Agile architecture and different aspects of it. And a lot of you probably know of Net Objectives already. Uh, and we pretty much do a lot of different things. As you can tell from the books, those are all books from people in my company that have written. Uh, I actually wrote Design Patterns Explained with one of my guys, and we do Scrum. And as you can see, we pretty much cover the gamut. This, of course, is going to be a technical talk on, on architecture. And in fact, I, I modified this talk slightly for C++. So I'm an old-time C++ guy, um, and I'm intentionally going to have a couple of topics to throw out to hopefully create some thought process and you know push back even that's okay because i'm going to talk about destructors and constructors in a way that's kind of an anathema to a lot of c plus plus folks uh, in fact my background from a development point of view i don't remember when i learned c i think it was 1981 did a lot of c work in the 80s uh, early 90s kind of learned c plus plus somewhere i don't remember exactly when somewhere in the mid 90s Learned what uh, learned about them, what OO was from uh, Grady Bush's uh, OOA and D or something, and some other things. And there was a oh, uh, uh, Borland had a pretty good primer. Actually, it was a horrible primer, but it was what I used. Uh, and I and then I've kind of gone into now you know Java and C sharp stuff like that. And I'll admit I haven't really coded an awful lot in the last few years. But I've done a lot with patterns, and design is actually something that's not language dependent, but yet it seems if you look at different languages, people do it different ways. So what I wanted to do, even though I've kind of known now for doing it more, as you might tell from some of the co-founder things, I do a lot more in, in process and lean and stuff, but it's very interesting. You know, technical stuff still very important in Agile, and a lot of people have forgotten it. It's very critical. Although personally, to be honest, I think where people should start that is an acceptance test-driven development if we go into it. But there's a relationship between all of these. But I'm just curious, how many of you are doing some sort of Agile? Because this is about Agile architecture. So most everybody, okay. So I want to start with a couple of questions. Oh, and because it says I'm co-founder, I guess I ought to mention I'm no longer associated with Lane Convine University, but I did co-found that with David Anderson. So let me ask a question. What are objects? So you tell me, what's your, what, do you, what are objects? How, what do you think of an object as being? What? Come on, somebody says, what's an object? You know, say your kid knows you're programming and you say you do objects. And they say, what's an object? It's an abstract what? It's an abstract of the real world. Okay, cool. Abstract of the real world. Well, give me another definition. Something you... A collection of functionality and data? Okay. Hopefully related. Hopefully. hopefully related to each other. Yes, that's true. Hopefully related to each other. Not always, but probably usually. What are the definitions? Yeah. Okay, behavior in an abstract manner. Yeah, you ask it to do something and you get something done. Okay, cool. Cool. There was something else said, but I couldn't hear what it was. An instance of a class, okay. What's a class? Okay, good. I'm, I'm actually real impressed by these answers. Seriously, I was, I was expecting somebody was going to tell me it's uh, data, data with methods. So you guys know it's not really data with methods. You all heard that it's data with methods, right? Okay, but good. It sounds like hopefully, you know, yes, it is. But it isn't really, because that's a bad way to think about it. So that's good. Uh, that set me back about five years myself, because I went going from C to C++. How many of you went from C to C++? Yeah, usually that takes you longer to learn C++. It's not faster, because the syntax isn't the big issue. But with C, we learned that we have these collections called structs, and then we add methods to them, and now we can hide the structs. And now, but, but if you think about that, then what you know you have is you have data. And data is kind of an implementation thing, and we're used to thinking about that. So let me ask you this question. I know it seems like a silly question. It's, I'll admit it's setting up the next question. If I was to watch you do your work, and I was to say, what percentage of the time is this person spending on typing? In other words, if, if you could instantly get it typed, 
How in a in an eight hour day, how much time would you save? Well, it's a real question. This is a serious question. I know it sounds silly, but it is a serious question. How much? Thirty minutes. 30 minutes. Well, that's not too bad. Yeah, if it's more than thirty minutes, take a typing class. Let me put it that way. Okay, so it could be thirty minutes. Um, so let me ask you this other question. If you have two choices, you have two approaches to take. Like I could do A or I can do B. And you could argue for either case. But if you do A, you could convert it into B much faster than if you do B and could convert that into A, right? Sometimes you have two different choices. And you say, oh, I blew it. I got to go the other way. And then you got all this work. If going from A to B was very fast and going from B to A was very slow, then if you didn't know which one to take, actually, even if you kind of really thought B was better, what might you do anyway? Take A? Especially if typing was all you needed to do to go from one to the other quickly? So I'm going to suggest most of good design is done in those two last questions. Now you can settle a lot of issues by just saying, well, if I do it this way and something goes wrong, or if I do it this way and something goes wrong, what's the difference? Except I, wouldn't, I don't ask it that way for myself because it's not a question of if. If I do this and it turns out to be wrong, or if I do this and it turns out, because it usually is for me. Okay? People think I'm being modest. I don't know what people are thinking. Sometimes I think people think I'm being modest when I talk about that. But the reality is I make a lot of wrong decisions most of the time in design and code. And out of a history of that, I can actually remember when I did this in 1984. So I'd been programming for 14 years at this point. I would have been considered a very, very senior developer at this point. In fact, back in 76, I was considered a very senior developer, very fast. I was a very fast coder of very brittle code. I will admit that. And up until about 84, I wrote code very fast. But it was also very brittle code. It would break easily. Okay? And I'm a slow sometimes in the thought process. And I remember in 1984, I wrote a bug, and I noticed it. And I asked myself, what was I doing when I wrote this bug? Now, two thoughts occurred to me almost immediately. One was I realized I was writing them because I didn't talk about it like I was writing them. You know, it's like I found the bug. You ever, have, you ever, you ever find a bug and you say, yeah, I found the bug? And then you wonder who wrote it and you realize you're the only person who has ever been in this code? So it's like, oh, I found my phone. Well, actually, with a phone, you do lose it. But you know what I mean? It's like I put it there, and now I'm talking like I found it, like somebody else did it to me. So the first thing I thought was, well, this is interesting. I talk about bugs like they show up, you know, or like Tess puts them in, right? Tess breaks our code all the time. Uh, and then the second one is, how come it took me 14 years to ask this question? I assure you, that wasn't my first bug, 14 years. In fact, it wasn't even my second or third bug in 14 years. And, yeah, you know, I thought about that, and I thought, well, yeah, okay, I'd been thinking about how to program better, but the real question was I was starting to ask the question, not how could I write fewer bugs. See, it's a different question. How could I write better code? How can I write fewer bugs? Then what was I doing when I put the bug in? Do you see how that's a different question? There actually is a very profoundly different question because one is saying, what do I need to learn? And the other one is, what am I doing? How am I being? What am I looking at? And I can still remember this. I decided, well, this is interesting. What am I doing when I put bugs in? I never actually seriously asked myself that question because I figured a bug was just, oh, I misunderstood something or I wrote the wrong thing or I, something changed on me. And I decided I would just start writing them down. Like, what was I doing? And I remember I had this yellow pad and I thought, well, I just need a sheet of paper. Well, actually, eventually I needed two or three pads. Seriously, I had like 50, sheet, 50 answers on a sheet of paper. The whole pad used up. I was like, must have been, what, 50 times 40 would be 2,000. I'm not kidding. I had hundreds, thousands of reasons. And what I started doing then, I was saying, well, these are similar, but they're different. And I started looking at this. So that was the beginning, I guess, of my inquiry into software development as what am I doing? What's the mindset? How's it going? And we often don't do this enough. We think that there's this set of rules or something. But I would suggest kind of the rules are a little off sometimes. So let me ask you this other question. Think about when you've written code and you then later found, and it's usually not right away, it's usually after a while. You know, you write some code, you're working in it for a while, and it's usually then you find it's not the way you wished it had been. What about the code is not the way you wished it had been? 
What what causes the problems? Yeah. Usually have the wrong abstraction or no abstraction. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. There's always some abstraction because even source code is different than machine code. So there's always some abstraction. So talk about that a little bit. What what kind of? Uh, Okay, cool. So let's take that. Does that sound familiar? Okay, so now, but, but sometimes you do this, and it doesn't cost you anything, I'd be willing to bet. I mean, you made a mistake. I mean, now, sometimes it costs you a lot, but is there ever time it doesn't cost you anything? You, you might be thinking too hard. If you make the abstraction, and it hasn't propagated, and then you realize it's the wrong abstraction, and you have to change it in one place, is it that painful? Not to, if you can find them all. Ah, very interesting. Very interesting. Boy, here, you're the first one to get one of these. Can you? I don't know how well I throw, so everybody near them, watch out here. See, I, ah, you can reach over there a little bit. Actually, it's funny, this is a perfect segue for one of my favorite shirts, because it's about me. So really, seriously, I was doing a design pattern class, I don't know, around 2004, 2003, something like that. And I did my first... My first book had come in out a couple of years, the first edition, and this guy came up in the patterns class and he said, Al, you've written a, a successful book. You ought to name something after yourself. So I like this guy immediately, right? I go home. I'm seriously, the first day of the class, I go home. I think about what can I name after myself. And this was the best thing I could come up with because I thought it had to be true. And it says, shall always law when n things need to change and n is greater than 1. I'm, I'm a mathematician by trade, so I have to use a formula in anything I'm naming after myself. And n is greater than 1, shall always will find it most n minus 1 of these things. <laughs> most people follow shall always law. But you just gave one of the clues. So then I actually didn't say anything about this. I would just joke about it in class, and people would say, Al, you ought to think about how to avoid this, or not how to avoid it, but what do you do with it? So I came up with Shallowy's principle. Avoid situations where Shallowy's law applies. He'd actually given one, right? If you type, if you have strong type language, maybe you can make the compiler give you a to-do list. I mean, they're called compiler errors, but it's a to-do list. So I want to start thinking, I know I'm talking right now low at the agile, at the architectural level, I'm talking at the code, but I want to ask one other question, and then we're going to kind of go on to the talk. So at the absolute bottom, well, what is architecture? So at the, I can think of at the top, like system architecture. You know, like am I using .NET? Am I using, you know, just uh, you know, whatever I'm using? Or, or it could even be the, am I on, uh, am I, what physical machines am I on? That, that's somewhere up there. Down somewhere at the bottom is like machine code, okay? So... Where does architecture live? Does it live just up here? Does it live down here? Is it kind of a fractal nature of things? Is there a characteristic common between all those levels? That's a question. Everywhere. Everywhere. I think it is everywhere. I think this is one of the difficult things about agile arch about architecture is because I, I can do talks about way up here and I can do talks about way down there, but yet yet architecture seems to have some common thread between it all. And one of the best things I've heard it said is that architecture is kind of like, they talk about it two different ways. One is it's if I'm in the architecture, I can't change the architecture. It's kind of what gives me structure. But the other thing is the intention is to make whatever freedom I have within it to make my job easier. It's kind of both the structure and a kind of creating space for me to work. Does that make sense? Is that, that fair? Anybody want to give me something better or just refute that? Or, or is that Okay. Okay, because I want to talk about architecture kind of at that level. Okay, I want to look at another thing. So I'm going to start a little bit with code, because that's something we're kind of familiar with with C++. I mean, just because we're developers here and we program. But I want to look at this question. So when we have a new system, an existing system, not a new system, and we've got to integrate some new code, we've got to write some new code, we've got to get it into the system. And it might be something that changes the design, maybe we didn't have enough abstraction or something like that. The question is, is it writing the code or is it integrating it in? Right? I mean, there's some time on both. 
but we seem to spend more time in one than the other. So is it writing code? Let's take a vote. Is it writing the functionality or is it in the integration? It's in the integration. The longer it is, the harder it is to integrate. Okay, now it's, this is a little depressing to me because I've been asking this question literally for 16 years. And it ha the answer hasn't changed in 16 years. Okay, and you think, well, 16 years, man, that's a long time. So I want to look a little bit about what's the purpose, what are some different perspectives. See, what I'm really more interested tonight, I don't want to really, I'll probably give you some tips, give you some tricks, because I can't help myself. But tips and tricks don't do you much good. Their distinctions in how we look at things are much more powerful. So, like the distinction between, say, an object as data with behavior, data with methods, or something that just has a, def a set of how it responds to different situations, pure behavior. There's a difference between those two. And depending upon how you look at what an object is, you will actually respond to changes and respond to coding differently. So I'll talk a little bit about the purpose, but also some different perspectives. So I've actually maybe jumped ahead a little bit with this. Uh, but why have an architecture? So I'm going to suggest that architecture is there for a couple of reasons. It can create a bigger picture. It can create some freedom for us. And now this sounds funny, but I would say it creates freedom for us by giving a structure. That it cuts off some options to create more freedom within the good area. And the cutting off options is actually a positive thing. Now you gotta be careful because if you cut off the wrong options, you're in trouble, okay? So we have this notion, we want to get an architecture that cuts off the wrong options, gives us the freedom to do the new options, and at the same time allows itself to evolve because we won't always get it right at the beginning. Now, it's kind of to me also a misnomer to talk about agile architecture because agile architecture, what does that mean? Okay, in the agile community, we now talk about one week, two week iterations, or maybe even no iterations. You know, if you do, if you're just looking at flow, you should be talking about things getting done in one, two, three days. Started, done, started, done, started, done. It's kind of a, there are, I think, some bastardizations of process now, or incomplete process now. But if, well, if you're in Scrum and you're doing two week iterations, you should definitely have like two, one to two, three day stories at most. And if you're doing Kanban, and I make a distinction between Kanban and the Kanban method, if you're using Kanban, just managing by flow, even though nobody ever talks about small pieces, you should be doing small pieces. That's the whole idea of lean, is small batches, getting quick feedback. But if you have these small things and getting them through, then the question is, you want to get feedback quickly, you want our architecture to kind of help us, and at the same time, maybe we need to change things as we discover things are wrong. So how do we do that? You know, I, I talked a little bit about this. These are some of the characteristics I think of it. There's, there's the technology, could be structure, could be different ways we layer applications. What can't be changed, what provides the context for change. It also, in a sense, kind of provides a vision. Architecture, if you're the only one programming, provides a vision for yourself. But if you're, it's kind of funny, what was that... Uh, Oh, you know, Kent Beck, when they came, with Extreme Program, they talked the metaphor, the use of the metaphor. You had something that said what the system was about. That was like their first stab at what architecture was and an extreme programming thing. But there you had a small group, and the idea was people understood it. It can create the context across an organization. Okay. So when you want to extend it, this is another question, because these two are actually related. Which causes problems? Notice I didn't say which causes more problems. That might be a better question. But they both cause problems, don't they? You can have a great architecture and shitty code, and you still have a hor horrible time. You can have a horrible architecture and really good code, you still have a problem, and now you might be able to fix the architecture better. I can remember times where I had some bad code. I hadn't really thought about something. I remember making a decision. I was working on a system... Uh, this was back in the, uh, when was this, 83, 84, and uh, was, was using C at that time, and we were running it on PC, on Windows. Uh, who knows what version of Windows that was, but it was early on. I mean, the PC had just come out like 80, 81, 81, and, um, and we had built this for the, 
what was it, the 8086? I think it, we were probably using the 8086 in those days. And anyway, 8086, I knew that someday we'd want to switch to the Motorola, you know, if you wanted to run Unix, which I knew we'd have to eventually. But I had always, so I'd figured out that we could, we could switch memory addressing. But one thing I knew for a fact was that direct memory addressing was always going to be faster than relative addressing because the direct memory's got it in there. Now, it turns out that was a mistake. It wasn't true. I've got, later, I found out a play, case where that wasn't the case. But because I had had code that had duplicated this assumption throughout the thing, in other words, I didn't really have a good abstraction, I could never fix this. Literally, I remember spending about, I don't know, about a week going through all the code, changing it in the thousands of cases. I missed one, apparently. And, I, and eventually, I just went back to my source control and said, I'm never figuring this guy out. I could never get it to, I could get it to compile, but it would never run. So code quality can be a big issue. So these are some of the things I talked about what architecture is. You know, vision, new ways of doing implementation, extension, testability. Now, what all of these kind of have, I would suggest, is that when something happens that we hadn't anticipated, something changed on us, something we didn't know. So in some sense, you could say architecture is really about mitigating risk. Does that make sense, too? It's a different way to think about it. Now, why do I want to think about it that way? I'm not saying that's all it is. But I think if you think about it from a risk point of view, it lets you look at your options a little better. That like if I'm, it makes you question yourself, which is a good thing for most of us to question ourselves. At least for me, I know it is. So I want to look at it as this kind of mitigating risk. How can I extend things? What can I do when things don't go the way I want it to happen? You know, what if integrating wasn't so difficult? What if we weren't tied to the system's architecture? I remember working on a, I was, this was back around 2000, 2001. I was, we were using Java. I don't remember exactly what year it was. I think it was 2001, 2002. Servlets had just come out. But for whatever reason, the guy who had built this system didn't want to use them. And he more or less made up his own kind of servlet type thing. It was like very interesting, very cool stuff. And I came in. He was going to go on vacation. They needed somebody to just substitute for him for a few months. So they brought me in. I was doing some work there. So we were doing everything with HTTP requests because this was definitely a, I mean, it was a web service. It was kind of a search engine. It wasn't Google. It was an early on search engine, though, of a particular type of uh, stuff on the web. And so we knew we were going to use HTTP requests. So HTTP requests came in, and then we actually just passed the little object around that had all the information on the HTTP request. And it turns out that that little object from an HTTP request wasn't exactly what you'd like inside the code. And it occurred to me, you know, this is really silly because if we ever decided to do it differently, you've got this stupid HTTP request duplicated everywhere. What would have happened if you just, when the object came in, you converted it into a system-independent collection of information about the person making the request, but don't call it an HTTP request. That would have decoupled the system from the application. And it would have made life simpler because I could have had it formulated. It's kind of an adapter, you could say. But... You know, what if we could be prepared for the unknown? I do not mean know the unknown, know the future. I'm precognitive impaired, so I'm not going to tell you how to see the future because I don't know how myself. But I can be prepared for the future. And you know when code's prepared for the future. You ever look at code and you say, oh, I'd never want to go in here again. Okay, you know that's not prepared for the future. <laughs> right? you, see, you know what I'm saying? See, we know this. We have these instincts. And sometimes it's at an unconscious level. So one of the questions we want to look at is what is it? We're not, we've got to be careful. We're not trying to anticipate change. See, when I started, I, I started saying something, I didn't finish it. Where the waterfall, we talk about, oh, waterfall's got heavy architecture, big design up front. But what people forget with waterfall, there is a design phase two. And design phase one typically covers design phase two. In fact, it makes it worse because we have the assumption design phase one is going to work everything out, then we get into a system that we hadn't anticipated and we didn't prepare for. The only difference between agile architecture and that kind of architecture is we don't anticipate it, but we prepare for it. So agile architecture isn't trying to anticipate more. It's just trying to say, you know, since we can't prevent change, we have to know it's going to happen. We have to accept that it's there. We actually have some other t-shirts. That's the front. It literally says that. I feel so much better. 
since I gave up hope. Now, admittedly, I came up with this T-shirt not thinking about architecture or design. I came up with it personally about thinking about one day I wish a customer would tell me what they really wanted. So when I wrote it, they said, yes, that's just what I wanted. But, but it seems to work well for design as well. So we want to see how do we design to accommodate change? What do we need to do? And I'm going to suggest these are some of the things that we can do that will help us. Okay. Change isn't the problem. It's the damage the change causes. That's the problem. See, if we think we're going to prevent the change, that's a, that's a fool's errand. You can't prevent the change because you can only prevent it if you knew it was coming and you don't know it's coming. If you do know this kind of stuff, let me know. I'll buy you a ticket with me, first class, to Las Vegas. I just, I'll just i just play the numbers you play. But if you can't do that, then you don't see the future well. And if that's the case, what if it didn't cause damage? So I'm going to suggest agile architecture is not building something that handles the change directly, but enables you to mitigate the damage the change causes so you can handle the change, because you don't know what that change is. And that's what we have to give up. Okay, so there are two kinds of architecture that are here as well. You know, there's the classic, I'm going to create a structure that contains everything, I anticipate everything, I understand the big picture, I learn what I need to do up front. Agile architecture create a structure that can change, preparing itself for any, literally anything. What you're really saying is not that it can accomplish anything, but that it's set up so when something new comes up, the cost of the new coming up later is no more damaging than it had it come up earlier. Because, it, it, you know what I mean? It's, in other words, we usually spend so much time anticipating the future, that's all wasted time if that future doesn't happen. If the change happens later, and now we have to put it in infrastructure, if it's not significantly more expensive, now it might be. Like, let's say I wasn't using strong typing, and I had to look in 30 places. Well, that's causing damage. But the strong typing made it so it didn't cause damage. Encapsulation, by the way, is another good one. You know, one of the worst architectural issues people would say is, like, Y2K. That's been a long time. Some of you, you know, well, actually, a lot of you here are old enough to remember it, but there are a lot of younger people here who don't really remember what that was like. But I heard an interesting talk by Bertrand Meyer, actually on the Microsoft campus. Bertrand Meyer is the guy who came up with uh, Design by Contract and Eiffel. And he said, and I, I thought it was good, Meyer's a very brilliant guy. He's one of these guys who says things that doesn't seem to make any sense. But he's smart enough, you know that's because you don't see something he sees. So you don't discount it, you just think, well, what's, what's he saying? And he said, uh, Y2K... The problem with Y2K wasn't that they used two digits instead of four digits. Now, I thought that was the problem. And I admit, I was around when this happened. I mean, I remember the computer system I learned on. I don't know if this was the first language I learned or the second. I think it was actually the first. I learned basic on a RCA 77, Spectre 77. And I remember getting an upgrade. We upgraded our memory, which was about this big, in 256K of memory, it's core memory to 384K of memory. So we can run 30 people instead of 20. Now you might imagine if you're running 30 people on 384K, I, I have more memory in this thing. You know, I've got gigabytes. It's, it's like you can imagine that maybe cutting down from four bytes to two in dates was a useful thing. So that wasn't the problem. In fact, in those days, you didn't store things on hard drive, you stored things on tape. And you downloaded your, or cards, and you downloaded from tape or cards onto these really big disk drives. These were about this wide and about this tall. And the big ones had 10 meg. And the little ones had 5 meg. I mean, those were, that's what we worked on back in those days. And he said the problem was they didn't encapsulate that. So where did you have to change it? You had to change it everywhere. So that's a good insight. It wasn't why 2 to 4. That was an engineering decision. But the lack of encapsulation made it an impossible thing to change. So you, know, you could say, well, people should have understood this and all that. But look, when you were writing code in the 70s, it never occurred to anybody that it was going to be used 30 years later. I mean, seriously. You know, we want to understand, though, the big picture so it can evolve. There was an interesting thread on, uh, actually, the Lean Agile group. Somebody was talking about test-driven development. And they, at some point, it got referred to as 
Hey, uh, somebody referred to some article, somebody was talking about why TDD doesn't work, and I read it. I was like, okay, well, they're just talking about if only you do TDD, and if you only do it in the XP style, which is kind of a little micromanagement. They're not saying you don't look at the big picture. Looking at the big picture is not necessarily big design up front. You want to set it up so as things evolve, you can do something with it. So I'm going to suggest the real question is how do we allow for evolutionary architecture? How do we allow for an architecture to change that has kind of a graceful way of migrating? So we don't hit some spot where all of a sudden there's a big cost to it. And by the way, there is this parallel. Like I said, I do a lot in the Agile space now. Lean, Kanban. Uh, I still do a lot of Scrum. But there's a parallel between, I would suggest, Agile architecture and Agile discovery. In an architecture, we're only looking so far ahead. In the Agile space, you're only looking so far ahead on the requirements. In the architecture, you're only looking so far ahead of the requirements of your system. But it doesn't mean you don't look ahead at all. It doesn't mean you don't have some big picture. Big design up front, avoiding big design up front doesn't mean no design up front. In fact, if you're interested in this, I have recordings on our resources called Avoiding Over and Under Design, where I actually kind of teach design patterns in the talk. Because to me, that's really what design patterns are about. They're not this big design up front type idea at all. They're actually, how do you handle variation? So how do we do this? We're going to look at both the behavior and functional level. So at the behavior level, I mean the outside. The difference between acceptance test-driven development and test-driven development to me is more the question of who's your customer. Acceptance test-driven, it's outside the system. It's the customer is the user. Whereas in test-driven development, I might be my own customer. I'm writing the code and I'm seeing how it works. And if I'm writing a system for, uh, as a component for another group, then I might do an ATDD by talking to them about how it works. But why do we test first in both cases? I'm going to suggest that testing first is a very powerful approach because you can't test it before you have it. See, actually, test first, I, I, can, I like Ken Beck a lot. I think he's very smart, but he really messed it up when he called it TDD because you can't test something that doesn't exist. I'm sorry. What you can do is you can analyze something with tests. TDD is actually an analysis approach. You're analyzing according to test specifications. You're asking yourself, how is this going to behave? Isn't that what a test is? This test will, this code is going to behave when it does this. That's a behavior specification. So TDD is actually, I'm analyzing my code before I design it, before I do anything else with it, seeing how it's going to behave. By the way, this is a kind of abstraction too, isn't it? Because I don't have any implementation. I just have how it's going to behave. I don't have any idea how I've implemented it. I can implement it a hundred different ways, but I get this behavior. So it gives me a way to concretely specify an abstract behavior in a sense. It's very powerful. Also, it, there's this relationship between testability and design, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But I wanted to talk about refactoring just for a minute, because refactoring is another thing that kind of there's an incomplete understanding of. So in we kind of know about a refactoring from Martin Fowler. You know, code smells, improve design without changing the function, you know, refactor to improve the code quality. It's a way to clean up code. This is a classic refactoring. And I talked to Martin about it once. I said, Martin, I like your book. And if you haven't read his book, you really should. And if you don't want to read the whole thing, just read the first 100 pages. Because it's almost like two books in one. The first 100 pages is about the philosophy of refactoring. And all he talks, though, about is fixing code smells, things like that. But I said, Martin, there's another kind of refactoring that's necessary. And that's when my code was good. You ever write really, really good code, and then a requirement changed, and now the code was insufficient? That's a whole lot different than writing really, really crappy code, and the code changed, and it's really bad. Okay, so there's a difference. The difference is, in the first case, the, in the first case I mentioned, it was actually the design was good, but the requirements changed. I have a different problem. In the second case, which is this one, my code was bad. So I said, Martin, there's another kind of refactoring. I have good code. It's tight. But a requirement means I don't have an abstraction layer. Like maybe I had an insufficient abstraction at the beginning because I had only one case. And now I have two or three cases. And now I need an interface that I didn't need before. And there was no reason to put it in. But if I, now I need to put it in. I could refactor to put it in. That's refactoring design. I call it refactoring the design. Yeah, it is called evolving the code. But we should recognize that the refactoring, look at all the methods in the refactoring book. You know, move, move a method, create an object. They're all the same methods you'll use in evolving a design. 
It's the exact same techniques. What do you mean by room for changing it? Well, see, I can interpret room for two different ways. I could say that if it changes, I can change my design easily, and I would agree with that. Or I could say I need to put in a mechanism to change it, and I would disagree with that. Those are two different, do you see those are two different things? One is, a, the second one's more of a framework kind of thing. I may not need to change it, and I've wasted my time on the framework. The first one says when I do need it, I can put it in. Yeah, so an interface is a way to offer it, but what if I have only one instance of something? Do I need an interface? What if I have only one way, like I have an encryptor class, and I have only one place I use it? I could. I could. But what happens if I have only one, and I need to go from one to two? How hard is that? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, yeah. So the the thing is, the interface actually, if it's not a good one, could have problems. Now, if I've got a place where I've copied it in three or four places, and now I need to look for it, even with typing, I get a little nervous. But if I could type it and find it, or see the problem with it changing, but but actually, it's right. If I get strong typing, so the compiler finds it, or the linker at times finds it for me, because that's another way to get things to search. So the question is, what's the damage? Now, I'm not actually saying don't have interfaces. I'm not saying that. In fact, I'm not even saying not to have interfaces all the time. Some people actually like that. I know some people, who, anytime they have a concept, they put an interface up in front of the object because it, it puts in layers and it makes it easy for people if that's how they think. If that's not how they think, it may be complicated for them. Yeah. Yeah, now if you have an existing system, it might cause a lot of issues. If you're writing it from scratch, it might not be that big of a deal. But usually where I've seen it, is where the interface is wrong for the general case. Because you don't know the general case until you try three or that's four right. times to implement Yeah, that's correct. Now, I actually, though, like what, what you had said about, like, one's evolving, evolving code or evolving the architecture. Now, the reason I still like to call it a refactoring is is because refactoring has all this notion. I'm going to suggest that the way you evolve a design is you evolve it without changing functionality, make it a better design, and then you add the functionality. That's, that's another way. And we'll see some of this. I'm going to get down to some examples pretty soon. So this is another insight I had years ago, which I noticed that if I had tightly coupled code, I couldn't always test the system. And I would almost tell myself, I wish I'd thought about how I was going to test it before I wrote the code. I wouldn't have coupled it like this if I thought about how I was going to test it. Or it's weakly cohesive. This class does so much, I can't, you know, the test is going to be complicated. Okay. Or it's redundant, I'll test it here and here and here and here. Man, why didn't I think about how I was going to test this? And what I realized is anytime I hadn't thought about how I was going to test it, I often had bad design. But if I thought about how I was going to test it, my design was better. In fact, the testability of code was related to the quality of the design of the code. This is a profound impact, insight. So there's this relationship. It forces you to look at the public methods again. What's the behavior? By the way, this is the first tenet of design patterns. The gang of four, have the patterns are actually about three things. And the first one is you design from the outside. Patterns are things with behavior. Patterns are not things with data. Yeah, they have data, but it's just not a good way to think about it. Okay, so that's kind of conceptually. Let's look at the, some of the perspectives. I mean, so there are three different perspectives I want to talk about. One is something Fowler also came up with that I liked. He talks about abstraction has a, that there are different levels of abstraction. There's a conceptual level, a specification, and an implementation level. He talks about this in his UML distilled. It's actually, he's got a third or fourth edition out by now. Conceptual is what you want. Specification is how you use it. That's kind of like our interface to the class. By the way, when I use the word interface, I don't necessarily mean the keyword interface. I just mean the set of public methods. 
And the Gang of Four, when they say write to an interface, that, that's what they meant. The keyword interface didn't exist until Java came out, and they reused the word in the vernacular, which was irritating but understandable since that was the year of the great keyword shortage. So they had to reuse the keyword. I'm just kidding. But it was irritating because there was a meaning for that, and they, they kind of usurped it. And then, of course, uh, C Sharp just followed suit, called it an interface as well. But the set of public methods. Implementation is how it works. You want to hide this, basically. That's what encapsulation does. In fact, when you talk about in data, when you talk about encapsulation, the Gang of Four didn't mean data hiding, because that's how I'd heard encapsulation. Encapsulation is data hiding. That's not how they meant it. They meant type hiding. You encapsulate the type. Gang of Four book, you know, the design patterns, elements, reusable object oriented software is a whole lot easier to read. If somebody had just put three lines there. By the way, when we say encapsulation, we mean we're hiding the type of data, excuse me, the type of class you have, type of object you have. We don't care about the data. Of course, you've got uh, private data. It gets a lot easier to understand that. So, what we're going to, what Fowler suggested is that an entity should operate either conceptually, like the keyword interface, that's a conceptual, or it should be an instance, an implementation, an extension, whatever you want to call it, of something, or it's a specification, but it's not all those. So, it can be a a conceptual that has a specification or an implementation that has a specification, but it's not both. You get into problems when you have that. So this is some good advice. Now this is going to get, I'll admit, this is going to be one of the controversial pieces I go into here. So I was reading this book. It was by Joshua Block. Effective Java was the name of the book. And Actually, I've been, I always credited him with this idea, but people who also read that book and talked to me said I just kind of made it up. Well, I was reading this book when I get inspired, got inspired and came up with this idea that if you use an object, you shouldn't know what type it is, not the instance. In other words, like if I've got an, encapsula, if I've got an encryptor, then I should only refer to the encryptor but not know what type of encryptor I have. I should always pretend I don't know what type of encryptor I have because then... If the type of encryptor I have, I get another one, it doesn't matter to me because I didn't know if I had one anyway. Now, that sounds like I've got to put layers in all the time, but I don't have to. Block said you, Block said you can encapsulate the constructor, and that's what gave me the idea of being able to do this. In other words, have an object, make an object, or use an object, but never make it and use it. Now, in Java, this actually works real nice because Java has a garbage collector. C++ doesn't have a garbage collector, which means... You can do a get instance, which I'll show you an example of, but now you've got to destruct the objects as well, which you don't have to in Java, but you do in C++. So let's look at this. So let's say I've got a byte filter. I've got some class that uses a byte filter. So down here I've got some program that gets a byte filter. And I know what I got here because I'm saying new byte filter. Okay? This is an example of something that knows what it's got and presumably is using it later. Now, if that type of byte filter changes, what will happen? I have to change my code. And, I'm, and I, ha I know how this byte filter works. If the new byte filter works in a different way, I've got two different byte filters working in different ways. Now, if I force myself, this, this is the power of this. If I force myself to not know what kind of byte filter, I'm forcing myself to abstract. What is a byte filter? Do you see that? Because I don't know what kind I have. It's forcing me to go to some level of abstraction. The way you do this is you use something called get instance. This is not singleton, by the way. Get instance is used in a singleton. I might even teach you two or three patterns here. Get instance is just how I get one of these. So I'll go back and forth between these. See, all I did is I added this static byte filter, get instance. I implemented. By the way, these are really easy to implement. See that? I just return a new byte filter. I then do have to have a return instance. I don't have it here, but I have to, in the destructor, or I have to have in the destructor, I have to have byte filter it's called return instance on itself. Sorry, I should have had that in there. I don't have that. Now, if typing's not your bottleneck, this doesn't cause you much problems, but it is not going to put the thing on the heap instead of the stack, and there could be possibly be some performance issues. We can talk about that later. What do good does this do me? Well, what happens is 
if I have this and I get some different kind of bite filter, this doesn't change. In fact, whether I have one instance or another instance, it doesn't matter. This is a kind of prep, but it doesn't cost much. Okay, so first are there questions about how this works? And two, do you, three questions. Questions about how this works. Two, do you see the flexibility? And three, what do you hate about it? Or I go into a fourth one. Did anybody wonder why I said return instance instead of destroy instance or delete instance? Yeah, it could be a shared instance. Yeah, see, you, do you really want to manage another object? See, in C++, the answer is sort of yes, of course, but actually that's the wrong answer. But that's kind of what you think. Isn't it? I mean, if you look at the way C++ is laid out, I make my objects, I destroy my objects, I'm always in charge. But the reality is I might want to use a singleton, which means I have an object over here. See, singleton has been defined as when I want something like a global reference. But what if I have an object that's hard to instantiate but doesn't have any state? Now, if I've got an object over here that doesn't have any state, is there any value of instantiating a new one every time? No. But if I have an object over here that makes this object and knows, has to know whether destroyed or not, then doesn't this object know something about that object? Then they're coupled. Why does this object need to know anything about how this object is instantiated? So in a sense, this little thing decouples things. That's right. You have to manage it within your destructor. You have to do a return instance. So you have to do it yourself. That's correct. Yeah, and I apologize. I didn't put it up there. Yeah, so, but remember, this is just typing. No, it's also screwing up. It could be, but it may not be. Yeah, I'm sorry, because you... I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, so that's another thing. Yeah, so maybe we use smart pointers. Yeah, actually, smart pointer would probably be better, a better solution. But the, the point is, I was trying to talk about, and I appreciate, heads up. I'm throwing all right today. The, the, edge, the question is, it's interesting, when you make an object, you don't really want to know about its state. Like you said, maybe I share them eventually. You know, in fact, things like object pools, where I can share objects, is, can be very powerful from a performance point of view. But you're right, you have to be careful about the leaks. It's nice when you've got it on the stack, it'll automatically clean it up. If objects go away in a certain ways, you have to make sure you can get rid of it in certain ways. But on the other hand, sometimes you can get better memory leaks by having things be here and you have a way of cleaning it up as well. You're writing your own garbage collector, but there, there is that issue. Yeah. Yeah, and personally, I like smart pointers the best. Because then you're putting your rules in a place where you can identify. When the nice thing about smart pointers is you're actually locating all your, your rules about the life of this thing in one place so you can find it. That's actually encapsulation and lack of redundancy are amazingly powerful. And I'm starting here at the bottom level with the language. We'll move up a little bit to see how this would apply in other architecture. The thing I'm trying to do is not say do this blindly. I'm just trying to challenge our thinking about why do we, do we always have the object that makes an object control the object that's there. When you do it on the stack, that's what you're doing. You're saying it's coming into existence and it's going out of existence, and maybe I don't want to do that. So I'm really mostly trying to raise that issue than say always do this technique. And in languages like Java and C Sharp, it's safer. Yeah, it was another question, yeah. Depends on something sculpted in class. Right now you have a static class. Uh, 
what, what I'm trying to say, the, the main method you're preferring so that it doesn't have to change. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so what would happen, what would happen if this rule changes? Where I do the rule, how I do the rule changes. Actually, I don't have time to go into this, but we talk about this a little bit, where you can say, well, as, it, as the rule of construction creates, well, I might want to make a factory. I might even have several factories that are abstractly in there. But what the idea, again, is what I'm doing is I'm hagging in one place all the rules about construction. If I need to move it, I can now evolve the design by moving that get instance into a factory, even, that returns that. So this is, that's part of the key. Yeah, but my concern is that do you feel like by having the get instance, that would be harder, uh, easier than just finding all the references to the new constructor in the case that you actually need to? Well, if you, the question is, let's say you have it in the constructor, and now you have to change the rule. Like in one case, so in one case I need one, and in another case I need another. And I start putting, oh, I'm in this case, if I do it here, and now I duplicate that someplace. If you can do it in a way without duplication, I'd say there's almost no difference. So I'm not going to argue, here's A and here's B, and there's no duplication in either one. I don't really care what you do. Because you can convert from one to the other back and forth because there's only one place. But if one has a lot of duplication, see, if, and this is why I'm also not saying to do this necessarily. See, if I start out where I have new byte filter, and I just have new byte filter all sorts of places, I can find all those places real easily. But if I start putting some logic around new byte filter, high filter, low filter, I can't find that so easily. Yeah, yeah, so you see we're, we're pulling out the issue isn't the get instance. The issue is, is the rule about how you apply it in more than one place. This is the issue with architecture, I'm going to suggest, is how many places do you have to go looking at any level when it's more than one? In other words, you should have only three cases. No case at all. Those are easy and I'll do them for you. I have one case, or I have to treat it, I have an infinite number of cases. But that takes a lot of discipline. So a lot of people will say, oh, oh, I got another one, so I'll just put an if here. And then, oh, I'll copy it because it's easy. And then, by the way, if we go from one to two, going from two to three is easier. So in some sense, there's an argument. So how I do it depends on the people I have. If they're more highly disciplined, I don't mind this. If they're not highly disciplined, I mind it. Because they'll go from a copy to a copy, and then when it's time to put it in, I can't find them all. So that's part of the issue. OK, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so you're saying if an exception is thrown, then you won't get it back to be able to erase it. So, lots of times you can program in the world of exceptions to say any exception is back in the box register. But lots of times you have to say, I have to cover in which case. Yeah, that's a good point. We should probably write up some examples with that when they happen because that's a good place for leaks and things to happen. But I'm really trying to be illustrative of the point. Sure. Yeah, but that's a good, that's a good observation. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so what do I mean by structure? Because I'm not sure I'm going to get through all the thing. I, was, I prefer not to cover all the material and we just talk some. You know, one layer not knowing about another layer is an idea. This is a common kind of system architecture type thing. I did want to talk about a couple other... Simple, I think I've probably already talked about this. You know, objects aren't data with methods. They're really manifestations of concepts of behavior. Um, Separate use from construction. I think I actually just mentioned that. Um, we want to, you know, if we're designing a, a sales order system and we instantiate it and handles a particular one, what happens that as soon as we get a new variation of things? So if we have multiple tax. The question is, how do I handle multiple taxes? Where is that? Where is that hidden? You know, some people like when I learned objects orientation, they said, "Well, object orientation is about reuse. I could take a sales order, I can derive 
in your classroom, and this is actually really horrible code, say this derives from that, because in this class is sometimes an abstraction and sometimes an implementation. So what we want to do is at least have them be separate. Now sales order is a concept. It's not used for specialization. We really shouldn't use it. What we want to do, because if you, you can get tall class hierarchies, right? You ever see this? Now we know we wouldn't we don't really want the tall class hierarchies, but in practice what happens is we start having them because we can only change part of the hierarchy. So we tend to copy and paste different things. This is really another idea of things, is that well, can we encapsulate things like encryption? This is actually the essence of patterns, is that you hide variation. And to me this is the essence of architecture. How do I hide what might vary? See, if I do something on the right, I get encryption varying, and I get, say, something else in varying. I can just keep pulling things out of chip and hide the variation behind an abstraction. That's, by the way, a strategy pattern on the right. But it's actually, the way I like to think about it is it's a way of varying, hiding the variation of encryption so I don't know that things are varying. Now, this doesn't scale because as I get more variations, I get a taller hierarchy with more duplication. So if I do something on this nature, and this is what the class inherits to specialize here, I'm using inheritance to categorize. Oh, I got encryption. Chip has encryption. Chip has something else. Okay, I'm decoupling the concepts. It's a useful technique. So what we would do before when we had that, that other thing was I could have a sales order containing a Caltex. This is actually now data injection. You've probably heard that. I'm injecting calc tax into the sales order. It's because then I'm hiding the variation of calc tax. Now calc tax can change any way it wants to. It's part of the idea. This is, like I said, this is a strategy pattern. Okay. This actually then becomes an interesting thing with dependency inversion. Actually, Bob Martin has a really good article on this. But the idea is kind of, and here's a URL for it, but the idea is really interesting. We normally think, we normally think we're designing objects based on what the objects are. But Bob suggests that what you do is you actually design the object on the basis of how it's going to get used. In other words, not what it's implementing, but how its interface should be. This is going to an outside-in type of thing. So abstractions don't depend on the details. The details depend on the abstractions, and the abstraction is based on how it's getting used. I mean, who's calling it from the outside? Because then you can have different implementations and you don't change the way the caller's calling it. This, again, is a method of containing variation. Okay? This is, again, designing for the unknown. Now, there's this notion of how do we design things? Okay? So let me give you a situation I was in. I was working with a group, and they had this real-time system. They had different machines talking to us. This was kind of a manufacturing plant. It wasn't actually building things. They were actually it was kind of cutting up wood and lumber and things like that. But raw materials would come in. They'd go on these conveyor belts on these machines. And the machines would have to tell another machine when it was going to get the part or, the, you know, whatever piece of wood or plaster or whatever it was. And it wasn't always the same thing. You know, there were, there were switches that could shift something from one place to another place. Obviously, this has got to be real time and up to speed. Because if one machine is not ready... When one machine sands it off, things break, people, things explode, people are near these machines, they can get hurt. So one of the things they knew is there would be a performance problem, because you always have to worry about real-time processing as if there will be, but they didn't know what it was. So the question is, what do you do about this? And it seemed that these were three options. One was figure out where the performance will be, but I get very nervous about this, because if I'm precognitive impaired, which I am, I may not anticipate things. But I could use what appears best and try, but then if it's wrong, I have a problem. And actually, Scott being one of our consultants came up with kind of a, just a funny joke, which is these, these, these magic cards of his. It actually says Scott Bain's magic consulting card on it. And the way what Scott said is you do is you shuffle the deck, and then you just you say what's the problem. The problem is I don't know how to handle the message messaging system, right? I mean, what do I do? Build a really fancy messaging system and then discover I didn't need it. Build a weak messaging system, then decide I can't change it easily. 
So how do I handle the messaging system? So you say that question, you pull a card over and you read what it says, and this one says, encapsulate that. In other words, I should encapsulate the messaging system. That's what I should do, isn't it? Because if I encapsulate the messaging system and I find they made a mistake, I just ch change the behavior of it inside, and now it'll work, now that I know more, right? That's pretty cool. It's a pretty good deck, isn't it? By the way, you probably figured out they also encapsulate that. Uh, but it's because that's what you do with what's not known. See, it's funny. The design patterns are known for encapsulating variation where you get it designed up front, right? I'm going to think of all the things. We can design up front as you figure out all the things you're going to need. And then you encapsulate it. But in Agile, aren't we encapsulating variation as well? In other words, at the beginning, there's a certain level of understanding, and then we need one implementation, and then later we learn more and we need a different implementation, and then later we learn more, and we need a different implementation? Aren't we still varying implementation, even if we only keep one? It's the same problem, isn't it? So agile variation is, in a lot of ways, not any more different than multiple variations. So you want to encapsulate it. The way I actually think about this is a little bit, this is what I do. How would I design it if I knew that no matter what I did, it'd be wrong? Because it usually is. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, but I can unit test it, but then if I have to worry, change it all the time with lots of unit tests, it may be expensive. But unit tests would tell me I broke it very quickly. And that would be very useful because actually fixing code isn't the problem, it's finding the fix that needs to take place. So I agree, unit testing goes a long way. But unit testing, if I do unit testing, if I do it as a test first unit testing, I'm also going to think about it from a behavioral point of view. Yeah, but, but unit testing, I, I kind of thought that's how you meant it. But unit testing from a test first point of view is a lot different than unit testing after it's been designed. Yeah, and we don't like that second one as much, right? We like unit testing where you think about the test before you write the code. Because then you can change the implementation, and the test actually still should be there. You only change the test when the behavior changes. But I can change my implementation. This is what allows the refactoring of the design. I can actually change my implementation. My tests still work. And now I add the new functionality, add the new unit test. I actually do it the other way around. Add new unit test, then the functionality. So these are different ways. Actually, I, I already did this with a thing, so I can just go through that. So the good news is this notion of encapsulation is usually always right. The bad news is it doesn't tell us what to do. In this case, I kind of, you know, this is something I want you to, if you want to look at places, we have this thing we call net objectives. It's just historical reasons why it's called net objective test. You can get there from our website as well. But we view that all these patterns are about variation, hiding variations. I'm not trying to do a sales pitch on, var on patterns, but patterns are actually quite useful. Like strategy, bridge, template, method, and null objects are different kinds of behavior. Decorator, chain, and responsibility template are different ways of managing sequence. Workflow can be done by those four patterns. Patterns are about hiding variation. And the adapter, things like that, are about ways of taking existing th systems and putting them in, into it. Okay. Then this is the last one. I think I've actually even talked about this, avoiding redundancy. I forgot I had this in. I want to talk about shall always law. See, here's the problem with Kent Beck's once and only once rule. It's impossible to follow. That's the only problem with it. It is. It's impossible to follow it. If you have a method here, and you have someone who calls the method, then how many places are the rules of that method? Both places, aren't they? So already I don't have, I've, I just call something, I don't have a once and only once. I got it defined here, I got it defined there. So I know what he meant. But the problem is, it's not so much as it once and only once, the question is how many places do you have to look? Yeah, if you only have to look in one place, then I'm happy. If I have a method, call another method, and I change this, then the compiler gives me a to-do list. If I define an abstract class with virtual methods, and I instantiate a new type, and it doesn't have that virtual method, the linker will tell me it's missing. I don't have to look for it. This is one of the powers of strong type languages. By the way, strong type is not necessarily good I had an interesting interaction with uh, Bruce Eckel, who I don't think has been very active in the community for a while. I have no idea what happened to him. He used to live in Boulder. I really liked him. He wrote Thinking in C++, Thinking in Java. 
and he and I used to we never collaborated professionally together but we'd come across each other at conferences all the time and did a few presentations together and now why was I thinking of Bruce there was something he said that I liked ah oh, strong type languages yeah so when I read his thinking in C++, one of the first things he says about why C++ is so wonderful is that it's a strongly typed language. And then he started learning Python, and he said the wonderful thing about Python is it's a weakly typed language. <laughs> I'm serious. He didn't know any weakly typed languages when he wrote the C++ book. And what he found was, I'm not gonna, I don't know any weakly typed language myself, so I'm not going to get into the debate, but I, Bruce is a very smart guy. And he said something I found very interesting. He said with Python, you were just looking at what's the behavior of the objects. You weren't worried about what type they are. And that looking at behavior is better than looking at type. And I believe that. I do believe that. But what that means is, but there are advantages to strong type language. I'm not disputing that either. In fact, there are some things that get me nervous about weakly type languages. But you have to remember there's a downside when you know what type you're working on. And that's what Bruce was saying. That it's better to always think in terms of what's the behavior. By the way, this is kind of what the intention of templates are. Templates, I never really understood templates until, I guess, I think it was when I read Copeland's book, Multi-Paradigm Design in C++, which if you haven't read, I don't really recommend it that often, but you're all C++ programmers, so I'm going to recommend it to you. It's a really good book. You can also get it for free on our website because we, we found a copy of his doctoral dissertation, which is virtually the same thing. I mean... They, they literally Addison Wesley took his doctoral dissertation, edited it, and sells it for thirty bucks. But the doctoral dissertation's in the public domain, so we just linked to it. Same thing. And if you think about what's an interface in like Java or C sharp, it just basically says what methods these objects behave, right? And that all they are. It says, oh, this object does this, 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 and this. Think of a template class. What does it do? It says, oh, this ob this thing does this, 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 this. It's the exact same thing. So it's, it's another, another useful thing to look at. Okay, so I think I might almost be done. The thing I'm trying to bring up with these issues, and I know some of you have heard a lot of these different issues before, I'm just trying to present it in a way that, to me, the thing with C++ is the bias has been so much toward the implementation aspect of the language. Now, I don't think this was the intention. I have actually remember reading from some of the creators of C++. I mean, it wasn't like these guys didn't know object orientation. The fact that they wrote a language that has people tend to get bogged down in the implementation was a side effect that they weren't, I don't think they were anticipating. C++ has the ability to get you very close to your machine, which is good, because you can get very high performance out of it. But it has a disadvantage of we tend to think high performance is always necessary. The reason I made those comments at the beginning is high performance isn't always necessary. And when you go after performance, you sometimes make assumptions that are very hard to unravel, like that assumption that direct memory addressing was always be faster than indirect. I mean, that just seems so logical, but it turned out to be wrong. But because I had assumed that to be true and it was in my code, like the two bytes instead of four bytes, I couldn't ever fix it. Actually, in my case, I couldn't fix it. Y2K, they threw enough resource at it. I could never fix my code. I just ended up with having problems. I mean, I just had, had limitations on where the machine could go. I was always running out of memory. So the thing is, let's, I want you to challenge. The, the idea of today wasn't so much to give you specifics as much as to have us challenge some of the questions about what is architecture. I'm going to suggest architecture is defining things so that they can be changed and that the two or three main things about that is that when something varies, it's not that I've handled it, but that I can handle how I have to handle it in a well-defined manner, like refactoring. That's why I like the refactoring idea. And you're, you make a good point. Maybe that isn't really refactoring. It's not refactoring code. But refactoring code in a well-defined way, how do you refactor your designs in a well-defined way? That's my question. When we think about C++, because it doesn't have a garbage collector, so we tend to favor the stack. Although in some cases, by the way, stacks aren't allowed. I, I've been on military applications. You can't have anything on the stack. Because they're worried you'll run out of memory. You don't reboot when you're in the middle of a dogfight. I'm serious. Okay? 15 seconds. They, the enemy doesn't stop shooting at you for 15 seconds while you're 
weapon systems are rebooting. So I've been on systems where a new, I mean, you could have it when the system comes up, you can do all the news you want. But after that, you, don't, you can't put anything on the stack. Because who knows if you'll run out of memory or not. So they make you allocate everything, and then you work with it. Okay, now that may be, maybe then there's no point in, the, in separating of use from construction, except I think there is, even there, because then you can say, when I want to change which objects I use and how do they interrelate, I make those decisions at the original beginning of things. Okay, of course, that's a different issue. So I'm really trying to get us to challenge. I think that's the real key, is how do we understand what we know and how do we challenge it at the same time? Okay, so questions or discussions? I don't know. I know this was a little bit different talk than probably you were expecting, and I was, uh, actually, it's a little different than I was expecting, to be honest. But coming out here, I was just thinking about, you know, having done C++ for so long and just remembering what shifted in my, behavior, my own mind, what shifted for me. I, I can actually still remember when C++ shifted completely as a language for me. It was in 1997, actually maybe maybe late 96, where I was reading the Gang of Four book, which by the way I do not recommend anymore. It's just it's just even if even for C++ programmers and there's some C++ in there, it's just too old and it's fairly obtuse. Uh, but it, it's a brilliant book. It's just that there are better books. In fact, another good book that that uh, Heads First hasn't come up with a. A design patterns in C++. As their head first design patterns book in Java is brilliant. Uh, but it doesn't deal with a lot of the C++ stuff. Well, actually, Schmidt's work does a lot of stuff. Doug, Doug Schmidt does a lot of stuff with C++ and patterns. That's a good book I'd recommend. Actually, our book, the Design Patterns Explained book, is very good about the thought process behind patterns. And we have some examples in C++, some examples in Java. I think we have complete C++ examples. They're not in the book, but they're on the web. Okay, so there is a, there's a link there. And that's more of the thought process. But the issue is, for me, I was reading the Gang of Four book, and it didn't make any sense to me, but it was one of these things I thought was really brilliant. I, you know, I remember reading, I was like, man, this is the most, patterns are the most brilliant thing since sliced bread, and yet I'm not using them anywhere. That didn't seem right. <laughs> but that's where I was. And, uh, and then I was reading Chris Alexander's book, by the way, a Timeless Way Building, which if you haven't read, you really should read this book. It's, a, it's the best design book I've ever read in my life. And I read a lot of design books. And this is an old book, but it's still, it's still very, and it's not about software, but it's one of the best design books. And Alexander talks about how you design from context and how you design from the big picture and going down. And all of a sudden, when I was reading that book, it shifted my thought that patterns weren't about a solution but patterns were about adding a distinction into your domain. So like a strategy, because I'm sure most of you know what a strategy pattern is. You know, you're, you're just basically dependency injections, an example. I've just got this rule that I've got an interface, so somebody calls it, nobody knows what's there. The, the, the distinction is I have a different way of doing things, and this, one, this call, class that's calling it doesn't know which way it is. That's just the distinction. And that if we add the distinction, I don't mind when this knows what that is when there's only one place it's used. I mind it when there are multiple places. We now have an evolutionary design rule in our head. And basically, you come up with your own rules. To me, that's what object orientation and patterns are about. Anyway, any questions? I'm kind of through. I'm just, just rambling now. Was this useful? I mean, don't, don't try to keep me happy or not break my heart. I don't know. Does this may give you some insights and maybe give you some stuff to think about? That's really what I was trying to do. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, like, yeah, I know there are methods that just do automatic refactoring. You know, I get a little nervous about these sometimes. <laughs> it's kind of like, so I grew up, I grew up with slide roll. Okay, nobody even knows what a slide rule is nowadays. Uh, and it's interesting that using a slide rule forced you to think kind of in an abstract level just to see if you were about right. Because the problem in a slide rule is you got an answer, but it didn't tell you where the decibel point went. So I could get, I could get 17. Is that 17 million or is that 1.7? Who knows? So if you didn't step back and think of the big picture, like I noticed, I used to be good with maps. You know, I got my map here anymore. I'm not so good with maps anymore. I get lost. I used to never get lost. Now with this stupid thing, I get lost about, not that often, but about a fifth of the time. Maybe not that bad, but a tenth of the time. I used to never get lost. 
Why? Because I would read a map, I'd figure out where it is, and now I'm lazy. And if it's wrong, I'm, go I'm lost. So I think refactoring tools are great, but if they stop us from thinking, it's going to be a problem. And I think we are not thinking enough. Yeah, but I'm not worried about the get instance per se. What I'm interested in is what's all that function around the get instance. Right, but so my point is, I think you're right about the speech on that refactoring tool, but the way it is now, I'm going to have to think about doing objects Yeah, but can you find... See, I've seen things change that I don't think a refactoring tool is ever going to figure out. I've seen something like like, uh, like we had this, this like rule about when a customer is eligible for a discount. So at one time, we had one type of customer only, so we said, well, if they have this thing, so we put an if in here. And then, well, this was in about five places, so we found where that is, and we put those five places. So that wasn't that bad, and if we typed them in exactly, I might find them, but if we have an extra space in there, most search engines won't find that. So then what happened is somebody said, oh, but now we have a second type of customer. Oh, and when I'm in this code, I've always got this second type of customer, so they don't bother with the if. They just put it in the discount. So now I have an if one type of customer or this type of customer, and here I don't have an if at all. I just put the discount. No, no refactoring tool is ever going to find that. That's the problem, is we're too clever for ourselves. Because we save a little bit, you know, a few electrons don't die in vain by putting that specialization, but we're never going to find it. So I will agree with you as long as you write your code. If you ask yourself, if I have to find this, how many places do I have to look? Now that question is a very powerful question. And I'll give you an example. How many of you know the null object pattern? Okay, so the null object pattern is when you might not have an object, you make an object that doesn't do anything. So if I sometimes encrypt and I sometimes don't encrypt, and you got to see, do I encrypt or do I not encrypt, i got to check. Then the object calling it needs to know. If I have an encrypt class and the derivation of it doesn't encrypt, then I'll always have an encryptor, and one doesn't do anything, and the other one does the thing. Well, I remember one time I had this thing where I had an object that always, I always had, and I'm doing this object, and I called some method on this object, and I got this in 50 places in my code. You know, this object calls this method. And then I remember, oh, in this case, I don't have one of these. So I start writing if, I, if this object not equal to null. I write that once. I write it the second time. I think I got about three times in, and I said, you know, Al, if you find more than one, what do I know about me? I know I'm not going to find them all. That's the corollary to Shallow's law, by the way. If Al finds two, you know he's not going to find them all. Right? <laughs> So I remember, so I, I, un, I control Z, control Z, control Z, control Z, and then I put in an instance of the null object, so I didn't have to check that. So that's a very powerful rule. If you're going to do an architecture, the essence of agile architecture from a very theoretical point of view is if something changes and only changes in one place, that would be a very, I'd suggest that might be a sufficient rule, although it may not be, it may not be, uh, give you a lot of tips. Okay. Yeah. So what you're doing is the term I use is defining interfaces, and you're and you're defining your architecture by defining all the different interfaces, which which defines your universe that you can work in. But you might have done it wrong. What if one of the inter, one of the things that you have to add in breaks the? Interface? There's no if I did it wrong. I am going to do it wrong. Yeah, but. So then the question is, so then the question is, one of two things have happened. No, I mean, I, I, I take that seriously. I'm not being humble. So I ask myself, if I have set it up so the compiler or linker can find it, then I have to make the change. But that is like what, what the gentleman there is saying is that, hell, uh, you know, Eclipse or somebody can do that for me because I've got good refactoring tools. Because if I can change it if it's well-defined like that. But now let's say it takes a lot of change now I have to put in something a lot more significant. Is there any loss that I did it later than I did it before? 
I'm going to suggest no. I'm going to suggest making a big change at the end if I have to do it only in one place. Or if I have to do it with a global replace because I've got it as a well-defined, is not a bad thing. And that later I know more about my situation and I can do a better job. This is exactly the point. I'm, I'm actually asking that question all the time. What happens when I have to make the change? Not what happens if I have to make the change. And I'm saying what happens if, like, you find out that you've got a bike filter and you've got a, you know, a uh, instruction message and you realize that to make bike filter or instruction message work correctly for some new things, I actually have to meld and mix the two of them. Okay, that's right. So now you have that. So now you have that new work to do. Your interface was wrong. That's correct. Then I have to change it. But is the changing of it? See, I'm going to suggest change isn't the problem. The problem is the finding the places to change. So I do a trick question to people in most of my patterns classes and seminars. I ask them, how many people spend a lot of time fixing bugs? And I'll give you a T-shirt. In fact, I got two right here. I'll get T-shirts out of anybody who can convince me you've ever spent a lot of time fixing bugs. Because I don't think anybody in this room has spent a significant amount of their time fixing bugs. I got more T-shirts in my garage, so that got, it'll give out two. So if you think, so think of the time you know you spent a lot of time fixing bugs. Think of that time. Now think of the time from when you heard there was a bug, or you thought there was a bug, you started looking for it. And you made a change, and you realized you broke something, so you changed it back. Notice, so far I've not fixed anything. And then I've looked some more. Now you might spend weeks looking for the damn thing. But at the end of the day, the fix was probably just a few lines of code. Most of the time you're spending time finding the bug, not fixing the bug, and those are different. And it's not semantics. People say, yeah, oh, it's semantics. And here's why it's not semantics. And this is, by the way, the essence of our Agile technique, too. If I write a bug, and I don't have unit tests, and I discover it weeks later, well, actually, let's go the other way. I write a bug, and I have unit tests, and I immediately see I broke it. I can fix it like that, because, oh, duh, I just forgot about that case. Okay? I don't have unit tests. Weeks later go by. Nobody's been in my code. I don't fix it like that. That's different. If somebody's been in my code, forget it. It could take me a year. You see what I mean? So, so how these are the issues we have to look at. What, what was I doing and what are the problems? It's, it, and I agree. that there, I've ignored something really major. And it's funny because we're ignoring it in this building, which is part of the Microsoft campus. When you're writing stuff that other people depend on, the fact that you can find it may be insufficient. In other words, I can find all the places, but I'm making millions of people make changes. That's big. That's a problem. See, I'm surprised somebody didn't throw something at me. I, yeah, I know that's a problem. I can't, I'm already running over time. Then you now have a different risk. Now the risk of making the change, no redundancy is insufficient. Now you need something like the visitor pattern, the command pattern, uh, other patterns that enable you to change like the number of you know, there are ways to write interfaces where you can add methods to the interface, you can add parameters to the interface, and you don't change the interface. And I know that sounds contradictory, but that's what the visitor pattern and the command pattern do. So if I have that situation, then I actually have to not just follow no redundancy or the once, you know, the shall always law thing, shall always principle. Now you have to follow things like make my interfaces resilient if it's that important to me. But if it's staying within my scope, I don't need to worry about it. When somebody tells me, oh, Al, we're going to ship this to a million people, I said, well, crap, or good news. But, oh, I now have to, now I have to put in the command pattern. Now I have to put in these other patterns. But it didn't cost me any more now to do it than later, than earlier. Do you see what I mean? So this is where you always have to look at your risk. And by the way, I don't know what I just said is true. That's how you have to think, like it's true, and then continuously check it. I've been living with this question of emergent design for now 15 years. I personally believe it works. I personally believe you can always keep doing it. But I'm also dubious myself in looking for where it breaks. And I think that's the real attitude. Okay, So we're out of time. Uh, but thanks for, you know, uh, hopefully this was useful to you. I just kind of, I got to, I learned some things here from your questions, so I appreciate that. Okay, I don't know what you do to wrap up, but yeah. yeah. <laughs>